So the first talk of today is by Matthias Pierre from DESI, and uh, he's going to tell us about dark matter production from uh, preheating and maybe also reheating. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, let's also uh, try to introduce myself. So I'm uh, Matthias Pierre. I'm a postdoc at DESI, and I used to be here as a postdoc. So it's actually a great pleasure to be here again. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for organizing this very nice workshop and giving me the opportunity to talk here today. So, I would like to talk about essentially this uh, paper that we wrote in collaboration with uh, Marcos Garcia, which used to be also a postdoc here, and uh, Sarunas Zerner from uh, University of Florida. So, yes, I didn't exactly know what I was going to talk about, so I put this parenthesis here, but essentially, I'll talk about predicting. All right. Uh, so, well, I, I'm sorry to break this nice pattern of uh, doing Bible talks that we had on Friday, but we will have a slide with me. I hope it's not going to be too long. I, it's supposed to be short, but uh, yeah, we're already 10 years late, so <laughs> I will try to do what I can. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions and comments uh, whatsoever, and I will be happy to uh, answer uh, the questions. So uh, the starting point of my talk is actually uh, this following plot that I'm sure you've seen a couple of times, which shows the dark matter nuclear and scattering cross section as a function of the, the dark matter mass. And uh, you may have heard that we haven't discovered dark matter yet. So thanks to ex experimental colleagues, we have now a nice exclusion bounds from all kinds of direct detection experiments. And this is what is represented here in this plot in these uh, various colors. And uh, in the past few years, the, the sensitivity for this kind of experiment has increased a lot. And this essentially uh, pushed, let's say, the, the most common weak models towards very small corners of parameter space. And you can actually see this. Uh, for example, if you look at the Inspire paper with the title week, and you can see that there is some kind of uh, drop since uh, 2016, more or less. There seems to be like a rise in 2008. I don't know what this is actually. I don't know what it's attributed to. Maybe something some you know. Part of the kernel is that. Ah, you think? Oh, I don't know. I was still in, in high school, so. <laughs> but anyway, you've seen that since a couple of years, there is also a rise of interest in uh, alternative dark matter production mechanism. Sorry? How you can get 2023? Uh, good point. <laughs> <laughs> Someone she <cheated, I> guess. <laughs> but yes, actually, it might be related to the to the Pamela thing, but I'm not. Ah. Sure. Because okay. it was August 2008, I think. Okay. Good point. So we've seen in the last three years a rise of interest for this kind of uh, alternative dark matter candidates, such as axion, but also um, production mechanisms, but freezing which invokes typically a dynamics occurring in the earlier stage of the universe. If we haven't discovered any form of uh, DSM physics, uh, the question is the question of what is actually the dark matter is uh, still unanswered, and we actually don't really know where uh, dark matter could uh, come up in experiments. So the question that I would try to answer today in this talk is what could actually thought dark matter production in the early universe? So in order to answer this question, first we need to have a look at what we actually have in the early universe. So uh, eventually we strongly suspect that there was a phase of mutation in the early universe in order to explain uh, anisotropy in the, um, the CNN map, where the universe was uh, dominated by some scalar field with an equation of the parameter close to minus one, uh, where the universe was close to the theta phase. We also know that much later, the universe has been dominated by radiation in order to achieve a successful Big Bang synthesis. However, essentially, this transition phase in the middle, we don't have many hints about what it could be, and we don't have any let's say, experimental probe of this specific epoch of the universe. Uh, well, in order to understand what could uh, this, this uh, epoch of transition be, let's see what we know about inflation. So in this simple picture, inflation is achieved while a scalar field dominates the energy budget of the universe. In this case, we can write down the equation of motion for this important field phi in this usual form. And basically, we have constraints on the inflaton scenarios. 
uh, which are usually shown in the plane that of the ratio as a function of the scalar index. And we saw the latest constraint from the Planck and my set cake uh, collaboration. And we can express the usual tensor to scale ratio and scale index in terms of the store parameter, epsilon and eta. And in a case where the inflaton takes the form of this uh, potential, which is indicated by flats at large field values, we can express this store parameter in terms of the number of people uh, between the CN scale crossing horizon and the end of inflation, which is the quantity n star here. And if we require, for example, 60 fold of inflation, which for example is spread here, we see that uh, we can actually fix the amplitude of the parameter lambda, which is the unique parameter that appears in this potential here. And we can fix it by using uh, the determination of the amplitude of the scalar power spectrum given by Planck. And this parameter lambda does be typically order order of 10 to the minus 11. So by fixing this parameter, essentially the entire dynamics of inflation is fixed. And eventually, as inflation proceeds, the mean platform will start rolling down its potential. And for this very kind uh, of potential, we can show that to the minimum is potentially very correct. And here, this parameter lambda can be associated to uh, the mass of the inflaton, the square root of the mass of the inflaton expressed in terms of Planck limits. So, as the inflaton oscillates around its minimum here, we can actually show that over one oscillation, we have this approximated expression here relating the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And we can express the inflaton as being some kind of decaying envelope phi zero modulated by some cosine function here. And by computing the typical pressure and energy density of this quantity average over several oscillations, we can realize that the typical pressure for this quantity is actually zero, which essentially gives an equation of state parameter, which is equally zero, meaning that this um, quantity is inflated uh, oscillating around its minimum mimics a phase of matter domination error. So uh, this essentially completes the, the picture of the universe that I would like to consider today. Meaning that after this phase of inflation here, we have a phase as the inflaton oscillates around its minimum of matter domination. And eventually, in order to make the transition with the radiation domination of the universe, I would assume that the inflaton eventually decays to radiation after it undergoes many, many oscillations around its minimum. Meaning that we can kind of disentangle this phase here of preheating to the later phase of radiation domination. So based on this global picture of the universe, uh, what I would like to, to do and to see is how we can actually produce dark matter uh, from this kind of setup. So uh, in order to answer the, the, this question, how to produce dark matter in this kind of context, well, let me just introduce a typical scalar dark matter candidate right here that I will couple to my infant on film via this kind of uh, quartic coping signal. I will also consider a minimal copy to gravity, and I will introduce just a bare dark matter mass by hand in, in the, the Lagrangian. Okay. So here I wrote the, this lambda parameter that I mentioned earlier, which corresponds to uh, the mass of the inflaton in uh, Planck units. But for numerical purposes, I will take this inflaton potential that I showed before, the one with the 10h square form. So as the inflaton oscillates around its minimum after the end of inflation, this will actually generate an effective mass term for the dark matter mass here, where the discontribution from the inflaton will be just proportional to this topic signal. So I have a very simple setup, a very simple theory, just very few degrees of freedom, and I have essentially two free parameters, lambda and sigma. I will just assume that the typical uh, bare dark matter mass is much lighter than the typical scales uh, during inflation. And what I would like to do is to estimate what is the dark matter production for all possible regimes of couplings at sigma of lambda. So what I will do in the following is that I'm going to fix lambda to this uh, value of 10 to the minus 11 that allows to uh, essentially explain uh, and to be consistent with the plan data, and I will vary the coping sigma. So what I would like to do is to estimate the dark matter normal density, which can be expressed in terms of an integral of the dark matter phase space distribution over the moment. So the first approach in order to estimate the dark matter production consists in neglecting this fast oscillation of the on field phi uh, in terms of energy density, meaning that we will assume that the energy density uh, is essentially proportional to the decaying amplitude here, what I called phi, phi zero earlier on. And in this case, we can just write down the dark matter phase space distribution by solving this Boltzmann equation, where on the left-hand side, we just have 
the time, the relative of the infant, of the, the dark matter phase space distribution, and the right hand side, we have the collision term. This collision term takes the usual form, it's just an integral of various momentum times the matrix element corresponding to the production of dark matter out of the, the infant condensate. And as the infant is treated as condensate, I can write down the, the typical phase space distribution for the infant as being something which is peak around a uh, vanishing moment from here. So um, the Cleveland term then can take a uh, typical uh, form which is relatively simple, where on the right hand side here we have this, this gamma term, which corresponds to the dark matter production rate. And there are essentially two parameters that will make our life a bit complicated. One of them is this both an unknown factor, which accounts for the fact that dark matter modes that have already been produced tend to be actually enhanced. And this beta parameter, which is a kinematic blocking factor, which will depend on the dark matter effective mass, and this mass will be an oscillating function as the interval is itself an oscillating function. So to compute the dark matter um, production rate, gamma, what we need to do is to treat the interval as a coherent oscillating condensate, and we are going to express the interval in terms of this decaying envelope. And to, do the, and to do a series, a uh, Fourier series expansion of the fast oscillating uh, function of the interval. And we can essentially express the energy density of this uh, various oscillating mode in, in terms of an integer time, uh, the fundamental frequency of oscillation. And in this case, we can express that matter production rate in terms of a sum over all possible energy level uh, for this oscillating function, weighted by. Um, the transition uh, matrix element here. However, in this case, uh, this expression involves this beta parameter that I just introduced before, and this quantity depends itself on the dark matter mass. And as we cannot uh, keep track of the, the, the real value of the field as we essentially approximate it as an envelope times an oscillating function, here essentially the quantity that we have to include in this effective mass term is the energy of the interval itself. Meaning that we are we are going in this mass term to actually neglect the fast oscillation. We are not going to take essentially the envelope of the field and look at its contribution to dark matter effectiveness. So this is how we can compute actually the dark matter production rate. And we have found that for the specific case where the inflaton is uh, close to a relative potential around the field, the fundamental frequency is just given by the inflaton mass, and all this construction is just equivalent of treating the inflaton as being just a collection of particles. Meaning the Minkowski state time. Meaning that to compute this thing, we can just imagine that instead of having a, let's say, an inflaton, which is a, a condensate, which is just a few, a collection of particles with zero momentum, just producing dark matter particles, and we can compute essentially the, the amplitude by using the sum of the time angles. So to do so, we can just expand the metric in terms of Minkowski metric plus small perturbation, that will be the, the master periton. And the matrix element corresponding to the dark matter production will take essentially two contributions. The one coming from the massive breakdown and the one coming from the direct copying sigma that I, uh, that I introduced. Um, so when you look at essentially these two contributions, you see that they typically come with a minus sign. And this actually corresponds to, in terms of dark matter production rates, two terms that will essentially be opposite to each other. And you can see here this direct coping sigma here that corresponds to this uh, direct coping here, and the lambda parameter, which corresponds to the impact on mass, which will uh, physically correspond to the gravitational contribution to the dark matter production. And already there, you can see that if lambda is very close to sigma, essentially these things tend to be extremely suppressed. But I will come back to that later. So this is the first, this is the first way of computing the dark matter production in this kind of context. The second way, in order to account for full oscillation of the inflaton around its minimum, is actually to treat the dark matter as being a quantum field, living in a curved space time with a background which is generated by the inflaton. So, in order to treat, uh, in order to estimate the dark matter production in this case, what we can do is to write the equation of motion for the dark matter field here, which takes the usual form of a Kangol equation, plus the term which corresponds to the effective mass induced by the inflaton. And we can, in the usual way, quantize the field by expressing it in terms of full modes and uh, annihilation and creature operator that satisfy the usual commutation relation. So just by plugging this expression in this equation here, we can rewrite the equation of motion for the mod function. And this equation is essentially the form of a typical um, 
harmonic oscillator with the time dependent frequency here. And the time dependent mass uh, contribution to this time dependent frequency takes essentially two contributions. The one which comes from the bare that matter mass that I introduced by hand, the one which is induced by the metaton and the sigma coupling, and there is an extra term which takes the form of the Ricci scalar, which corresponds to the gravitational contribution to the dark matter mass. And this contribution will be induced as the inflaton creates a background of energy density. And in fact, this term carries information about this, this lambda parameter which characterizes the inflaton potential. So, in order to estimate the dark matter phase phase distribution, we can compute the occupation number, which can be just expressed in terms of this small function here. And we can just determine the dark matter phase phase distribution by rescaling the, the momentum uh, appropriately. So in order to uh, compute and solve this equation, what we can do is to solve the equation for the inflaton as a background and assume some initial condition for the dark matter. So for the dark matter, we will assume initial uh, Bunge Davis vacuum uh, condition, which corresponds to this uh, two equation here, and that physically corresponds to a vanishing initial um, occupation number for the dark matter. Meaning that we essentially start with computation by assuming that no dark matter has been produced yet, and we are just going to, to see how much dark matter will be produced from now on. Uh, but actually, by writing down the frequency square at the end of inflation, we, we actually realize that there is a term here which takes a negative contribution, which depends on the other scale at the end of inflation. What this means is that, for example, if you take very uh, small physical scales, which correspond to large uh, momentum p, this uh, typical mode will always be inside the horizon. So you can see here on this plot, we have presented the other radius as a function of the scale factor. And typically, for small physical scale, I will be uh, essentially always be on this black line, so I will, be, I will always be inside the horizon. Meaning that for the bunch Davis vacuum to be properly defined, I need to make sure that uh, these modes are actually sub horizon. So in this case of the red mode, at the end of inflation, I'm still at sub horizon, so I can apply the bunch Davis in different condition at this stage. However, for some modes that satisfy this condition here, because of this negative term here, I could end up with a frequency square which is actually negative at the end of inflation, meaning that I will essentially be here. So I will be super horizon. However, so what, what actually I need to do is to track this mode all the way down to this epoch where such modes are actually below the horizon in order to apply the bench initial uh, condition and integrate the equation for the mode function all the way uh, when they essentially re enter the horizon. As such mode essentially uh, left the horizon and re enter later on, they will experience a phase where the frequency square will become negative, meaning that this will result in an exponential particle production during this phase of inflation, and it will correspond to a red tint of uh, the phase space distribution. So uh, this is a qualitative argument about what's going to happen. And now I'm going to show some numerical results. So first, in the regime where I can neglect the recoping sigma between dark matter and photon, essentially the entire production will be just made via gravitational interaction. So here we have represented the dark matter phase phase distribution in terms of uh, Q, which is the co-moving momentum, which is the momentum we scale by, by some factors. It has defined in such a way that once dark matter production starts, this uh, distribution remains frozen up to the present time, and I can just essentially compute the dark matter density by accounting for it. Also, from its definition, it also means that all the, the modes corresponding to Q more than one are excited during inflation, while all the modes that have a larger value will be excited after inflation. So, uh, in the limits where, uh, so, so for all these modes that are excited during inflation, what's going to happen is that. As the dark matter mass increases, so if I go from uh, purple to, to red uh, curves, what's going to happen is that the spectrum will be red tinted, red, red tinted, meaning that as the dark matter mass increases, this mode will experience a uh, larger excitation during the, the quasi the Sitter era, and will tend to essentially uh, go all the way here uh, to, uh, to larger values for small dark matter mass. For typical um, momentum, which has like value, values larger than one, what's happening is that we see that the numerical result that we get by solving the equation for the mode function essentially matches what we could predict using the Boltzmann equation. 
and we get the typical face that is emission, which behaves just like uh, a typical power. So the Boltzmann approximation works correctly. However, it cannot account for all these models that have been excited during inflation and can only, only account for the ones that have been produced after. Um, so now that we have the dark matter based distribution, we can just integrate this quantity and determine the total dark matter relevancy. And as essentially this distribution tends to uh, blow up in the infrared part, we need to import the cutoff, which corresponds to the physical scale at the present time, meaning that we are only going to select scales that are wavelengths smaller than the typical uh, Hubble uh, radius. So we can just compute the energy density uh, of the dark matter as a function of the reaching temperature. The reaching temperature will control how much extra dilution I, I, uh, I add essentially uh, to the dark matter abundance. And depending on the mass, you can see that essentially I get a straight line. And the only difference here I make if I take dark matter mass, which are not entirely negligible compared to the, to the end of mutation. Meaning, if the dark, dark matter mass, the bare dark matter mass is much lighter than the other stage of inflation, I will expect a straight line here. And then for a reaching temperature larger than 34 G, essentially, I will saturate the dark matter rate abundance, which uh, is, of course, uh, going, going to be an issue. So, unless you believe that reaching temperature of 34 is 34 G is, is possible at this time, then you will expect this scenario to be essentially completely excluded. On top of that, there are some, some issues with the possible isotherapy constraint that Michele already talked about in his, his talk uh, last, um, last week. But there was essentially this paper here that kind of uh, criticized uh, the isotherapy constraint and claimed that such constraints are actually not present. So it's not clear to us what to actually think about this. So we are actually investigating, investigating this part uh, a bit more carefully. But in any case, this result will still be uh, hold up all in here. So if you, if you increase a bit the direct coping between dark matter and uh, the uniparton uh, part, the uniparton uh, scale field, what's going to happen is that as the effective mass in the uniparton limitation increases, you're going actually to regulate the phase space distribution in the prime part. So I increase the coping here between purple and red lines. And you see that all this infrared part tends to be suppressed. But you can also see that when the typical value sigma over lambda is close to one, you can see that the ultraviolet part of this distribution is also strongly affected. And if you remember what I told you five minutes ago, since uh, in the first approach, in the free approach, we determine that this two diagram comes with a negative uh, relative term. For sigma equal lambda, essentially, we expect to have interferences. And this is actually what we actually see. Or um, the when when we are treating uh, the dark matter as being uh, as, uh, quantum field giving in a, in a pure space time. So this is this is essentially consistent qualitatively at least with the first approach. So as we actually increase the direct coupling, what's going to happen is that uh, we can rewrite the equation for the mod function by changing variables. So I, I rescale essentially the mod function by this scale factor here, and I define a unitary variable. And the equation for the mode function in the limit where sigma is much larger than lambda, so when the direct coupling dominates, the equation for the mode function takes the form of a Mathieu equation, which is essentially the equation for an harmonic oscillator with a time dependent frequency, which is driven by a time dependent fault. Well, these two parameters here, a and q hat, are defined in this way and could correspond, for example, to uh, an energy square and a mass square through like a um, an effective or a fictitious uh, particle, essentially. So I have represented in this plot a function of q, this region in red, which corresponds to uh, the parameters for which this, this equation has essentially the stable solution. And all this region in white correspond to uh, a solution to this equation, which behaves in an exponential way with a, a real part, which is uh, positive. Meaning that in all this white area, I should expect an explosive behavior for this function x. So, for example, I represented here in blue and red. What could happen if you take parameters here in this plane, either in red or blue, and if you assume that these parameters are constant? As you can see, as I'm taking a red dot here in the, in the stable region, the solution is essentially flat. 
But if you shift in parameter slightly away and you are going in an instable region, this thing will tend to blow up. And this will correspond essentially to a quasi stochastic exponential uh, production. So, what's happening in, in, in our case is that these parameters are actually time dependent. So, a typical uh, mode will involve this pain following this trend line. So, they are going essentially to relax as the universe expands toward the point zero, 0, And as it will travel this slide here, it will cross several <laughs> instability lengths. And depending on the uh, the momentum, this mode could cross either very few instability events when they are essentially close to the y axis, or when they are close to this line A equal to Q hat, they will experience several phases of instability. And as the mode crosses these instability events, each time it will result in an explosive particle production. So, this is a qualitative um, let's say, argument about what's going to happen. This, this has been uh, nicely exposed. In this paper from maybe 20 years ago by this author here. But essentially, the problem is that since these features are almost quasi stochastic, we need to actually essentially compute numerically these things in order to make accurate predictions. So, this is what we have done. And I'm showing here the result for the phase distribution as a function of momentum by order of increasing coupling from uh, colors green to purple to red. And typically, as I increase the battery coupling sigma, I tend to increase the dark matter production, meaning that all this curve will tend to have normalization, which increases. And as you can see, that at some point, the coupling becomes relatively large, maybe 10 to the 2. And you can see this large resonance feature that appear here, with a, which tells you this effect that I've described before. So you can, we can really see this parametric resonance effect. But in any case, as in Platon eventually relax very close to the bottom of its potential, we recover essentially the Boltzmann regime where the phase test distribution behaves just as a simple power. Oh, sorry, Matthias. Yes. On this plot, what, what would be the, the curve corresponding to the sigma over lambda going to zero? Um, well, essentially, we will take this plot. Yes. Okay. Just to see that. Yes, but the, so the point is that this is not dependent here. So yeah, if you yeah, take yeah. a even smaller mass, you will get something very large. Uh, so in this case, there is no explicit dependence on the the effective the, sorry the bare of the mass, as we just assume that this quantity is typically smaller than the other the other scale, and the effective mass which is induced by the Sorry, what is the plot at uh, Q um, two? This no no. Uh, Q on two. Q on two? Yeah. So actually, the, the end of inflation corresponds roughly to Q equal one. Meaning that after essentially this, this um, well, after this value, the inflation will start to oscillate around its minimum, and this is where you start to see this large parameter present effect. So there is a drop here, probably because at the end of inflation, I'm located in a red area, but very soon I'm going to start moving to an uncertainty band. And this will result in a big essentially. Oh, sorry, if you look at if I look at the stability blend, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm like traveling along that one of the black lines, right? Yeah, like this uh, gray line, yes. For example, you can you start here, you have an exponential burst here, there's still a region of stability, and another one. This is what you can see like this kind of things. So this is essentially very hard to uh, estimate identically because of this. Uh, Large feature, and you need to keep track of all the quantities really uh, in time in order to determine this, this uh, phase space distribution. If I essentially increase even more the dark matter coupling to the infraton, what's going to happen is that I will produce so many dark matter particles that they will eventually back react on the infraton condensate and disrupt it. And what one should do is to actually account for the fact that uh, there is some nonlinear effects. As the interton is being fragmented, fragmented, and once we need to account for dark matter scattering with these free interton particles that are produced out of the condensates, and this is a complicated system to solve. So, in order to account for this, this back reaction effect, what we do, the first thing we can do is to actually consider this arc approximation, which considered, uh, which consists in introducing this term in the equation of motion for the interton. Well, this case square here has been essentially computed over all possible modes. So we are looking at uh, how the homogeneous contribution from this phase term 
will back react on the internal concept. The second possibility to account for um, for the nominal effect is to actually perform real data simulation, and for this, we have used this nice tool that Daniel uh, Figueroa presented last week, which is customer like this. So I, I don't think it's here today, but uh, I encourage anyone to use this code, which is actually like very convenient and quite easy to use. So in order to estimate how the condensate is actually being broken, what we can do is to estimate the energy density in front of the condensate by looking at the kinetic energy and the potential energy by computing it over quantities that are average over the entire lattice volume. So this will give us an estimate of what the homogeneous uh, inferton condensate co component will look like. And in order to, to determine what is essentially the, the contribution which is not part of the condensate, we can just make the difference between the total impact on energy density and the one which is part of the condensate. So here in this code, I represented the energy density as a function of time, and it's written a bit uh, small, so I don't know if you can see it, but we have computed this uh, condensate uh, component for the impact on, and when the scoping is typically over 10 to the 3, you probably don't see it, but essentially the entire energy density of the universe lies mostly in the form of a condensate, and here in a red, I represent the dark matter density, and you can see that it's a very much subdominant compared to the interval. So nothing much happened, and the typical equation of the parameter in this case is essentially very close to zero. As I increase the copying a bit more, sigma of lambda equal 10 to the 4, I can keep track of the dark matter energy density, and you can see that after uh, a few oscillation, there is like an explosion in production of dark matter particles. And you can see that the condensate component in blue here for the interphone started to decrease in favor of the particle component. Meaning that at this stage, we have essentially fragmented the condensate, and most of the energy of the universe lies in the form of relativistic dark matter particles at this stage and free interphone particles. And you can actually see it, this uh, when we look at the equation of the parameter as a function of time. You can see that this quantity essentially deviates from zero around the point of fragmentation as the universe is being dominated by a mixture of pre inferton particles and relativistic dark matter particles. So, I think we have seen a couple of ways of, of uh, estimating the dark matter density in this case, so the, the actual approximation, the Boltzmann equation of the lattice. Let's see if uh, and when these uh, approaches are actually consistent. So here I represented the phase distribution of some kind of momentum in the usual way. And in black line here I represented the lattice result from the, the R3 approximation power. Yeah. And as you can see, uh, it actually matches that quite well result from the lattice simulation that are resulted in green. However, when we compare this thing to a Boltzmann uh, prediction, which is shown either in red, blue, or purple, depending on if we include for this, uh, if we account for this both enhancement effect or this kinematic blocking factors here in blue. In any case, the Boltzmann equation essentially fails to capture this complicated dynamics due to the parametric resonance effect. However, in all these cases, they will essentially all converge towards the, the solution to the Boltzmann equation when uh, that kind of production occurs after the interval undergoes many oscillations, so for a large moment of heat. So R3 and that is essentially are essentially consistent for this kind of couplings, but Boltzmann will essentially fail in capturing the dynamics in the infrared part. As we increase the copy even more, what we are going to see from the lattice by increasing the time from purple to red is that we are going to produce so many dark matter particles that they will tend to quasi thermalize actually with the free infraton particle. And in this case, we can see that the distribution takes the form of some kind of exponential ish uh, detail function, which is sign of quasi thermalization. And in this case, I represented also the R3 approximation results here in black, which actually cannot account for this complicated nonlinear effects and essentially fails at describing the physics for such large, uh, large theory. All right, so this is just, uh, let's say, a snapshot of all these possible regimes that we consider today. I represented here the total dark matter co moving number as a function of this ratio of copying in our lambda. And I represented essentially prediction from the various methods that we have seen here. So in black here is the result from the, the archway approximation. And all this part, which is more or less in blue or purple, corresponds <laughs> to the gravitational production. 
we start, uh, we can recognize that there is actually a minimum in the dark matter production corresponding to maximal interference between dark matter, direct coupling, and uh, the gravitational channel. And you can see that the Boltzmann equation here fails of capturing what's going on for this uh, mode that experiences an excitation in the Lucifer uh, universe. So we can actually see that uh, the lattice uh, result of the lattice simulation are actually not that uh, far from the R3 approximation in terms of uh, order of magnitude. There is maybe one order of magnitude here, but the R3 approximation fails at capturing the full effects of the phase phase distribution. However, they agree, they agree relatively well in this intermediate uh, region where the couplings are essentially between 1 and 10 to the 3. And regarding the Boltzmann equation, it essentially works but only in a very uh, short range of coupling, essentially between 1 and 10. And either if you account for both announcement or not, we essentially get the result, which is wrong by you can need several of those of money. So uh, what I'm going to do here is just not just applicable to any generic scalar, it's, it's not just applicable to dark matter, it's applicable to any possible uh, light scalar. In order to just compute the resulting abundance, you essentially need to uh, convert this quantity in terms of an energy density at the present time, and this can be done uh, quite easily. So uh, that's it for today. And uh, I just wanted to show just a snapshot of the, the different dark matter phase phase distribution depending on the regime. And then you can see they are all very different and corresponding to uh, different things of processes. And I hope that you tried. Differently, how this uh, how the physics at place generate these kind of features, and um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. So, any questions? Good. So, first of all, thanks. I think it was very, very clear. My, my my doubt is how, or maybe my understanding is that this is not very robust as soon as you introduce some other, let's say, radiation field into which your inflaton can decay. In the sense that it could be that your, you know, your your initial case where you got the the reheating bound mm -hmm. uh, uh, actually um, breaks down if you stop your background uh, inflaton assumption due to the um, uh, conversion of the inflaton into a radiation field, and as well as in the last cases, for instance, if you have radiation, eventually this might thermalize. So you are implicitly assuming that you are very far from thermalizing your dark matter candidate, yeah. and you are also very far from coupling the inflaton to something else that dominates, right? Okay, so, so there are two points. Yeah. So, so this, this um, <laughs> essentially, this results. Yeah. Correspond to dark matter well, scan modes that have been excited during inflation. So it actually does not depend much on uh, what else the inflaton could couple to. Yeah, but what happens if you have a back react? I mean, if you stop this here, there is an implicit assumption that you have this condensate uh, uh, acting for whatever time you need, right? Yes. If this stops very early, you will produce much less dark matter, right? Um, what do you mean? Like, uh, in, in the sense that here you you must assume that your inflaton has the uh, your dark matter has the time to experience this this condensate envelope uh, uh, whatever for sufficiently long for for achieving that. If there is another field to which the inflaton is coupled and eventually stops this 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 evolution. Okay, but actually, so, so this this contribution is really like. A contribution which is generated during inflation before even the inflaton uh, starts to oscillate around syndrome. So, as long as you have a phase which is more or less like the Sita error, just the background that you generate will source this kind of background approaching. So, so I'm, I'm not saying that this is unavoidable, but the only way essentially to, to get rid of this contribution is the dark matter eventually to thermalize with, for example, some of the dark matter. And yes, there is an assumption here that the entire component, the entire dark matter component that we produce will essentially never interact with anything else apart from gravity. But this is, of course, a strong assumption, like a, let's say, catastrophic scenario, but a possibility. Uh, one other thing is that, I mean, we show very specific 
terminates the Lagrangian here. So, for example, if you add a quartic coping for the dark matter, so, so lambda chi to the four, this thing will actually look a bit different. And we are trying actually to understand how different it will be. And if, for example, the gravitational production will be impacted by this. But of course, as soon as you have the coping between, for example, the scale dark matter and the sun model, this thing will actually look different, yes. More questions? I have a couple of them. So, um, first question is there have been many studies over years and years about preheating, right? And I don't know if anyone considers this particular mass that you put there, this lambda, so the fact that the, the blank square lambda, but I want to understand what, so two questions. So one is, to which extent the inflaton potential that you choose plays any role in this, or is it just that it is quadratic uh, in the minimum? And the other question is, what is exactly the, the new thing that you did that people didn't do over 20 years or, or more <coughs> to work on preheating, right? To conclude that this could be the Right, okay, okay. so I mean, this construction is clearly not uh, the, the newest thing in, in the world. It's just like a correlative potential for the Newton and just uh, right. the easiest thing you can write. So, of course, people have been looking at this. Um, so, first question was essentially how this thing depends on the Newton potential. Well, so I'm going back to the, to the original potential. I think there are essentially two important features in this potential. The first is the quite cut here, obviously, in this case. Yeah. But this is something that you, know, you can play with it, but certainly you are constrained, so the potential has to be flat. And the second is how it looks like during this minimum. And if you have something which is uh, not uh, quadratic or quartic, this will actually affect a bit uh, what we have done, of course. But we don't know how, how century. But but before before uh, there was this strong bounce on the tensor to scalar ratio, if someone would have assumed that the potential was quadratic. Choose the mass appropriately, no? according to this value of lambda. Mm -hmm. Just so lambda times the blank square. They, they could have found the same, right? So right, okay. So so and you answer the second question. Okay. <laughs> so if you want, uh, what we have done and which hasn't been done at least to our knowledge is to account for this thin transition at least from something which looks like the theta and the radiation in the mirror. I haven't seen actually a, a actual numerical computation where people have done that. So what they have done is to approximate, for example, uh, let's say, what do you produce in terms of gravitational production if you are in pure the sitter and what you will get here, but actually accounting for this intermediate phase of uh, matter like elimination is actually affecting the, the total result for the energy density. But also, so what we have also done when it's actually summarized in this plot. But we actually found that essentially, if you want to suppress the gravitational production, the limitation, you, you consider this um, sort of iterative copying to the inflaton, which tends to suppress the total production, which is also like an interference effect. And I, I don't know many reference, or at least I don't know reference where this has been actually shown. And on top of that, we have actually checked how consistent were these kind of methods. Like the Boltzmann equation, and we actually see that the Boltzmann equation is actually working, but you see, like uh, for a very narrow range of coping, so meaning that you cannot really make accurate prediction with these things. And this is something that has been considered for quite a while. <coughs> and this shows that, I mean, you can consider it, you can get an order of estimate, uh, order of magnitude estimate for the total production, but eventually this is this uh, phase. And we have also checked this consistency between R3 and lattice. And on top of that, we have we we looked at um, structure formation constraints and uh, things that I haven't talked about in this, uh, in this talk, but are also part of the data. Someone else? No, if not, maybe I can ask. Uh, ah, okay. <laughs> so you consider values of sigma over another, they're very large, but uh, looking at the Lagrangian, it seems that you can generate lambda for root of sigma. So Yes, this is the, 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 the cutoff. <laughs> so, for all the values of coupling over lambda here, since lambda is actually 10 to the minus 11, we will not expect quantum correction to affect 
the, the dairy cuttings in Mother Finger. I think that's for the entire plane here. Uh, sigma, sigma is always larger than lambda square. Okay. Again, because I arrived late, so I'm sorry to say that I cut already, but what's your cut of here? What do you mean? Your mass for that, your energy cut of, because naively I would say that to get something like, uh, now, okay, the sigma squared, no, you get lambda for the sigma over Five squares around the fabric and just cut off of that one. Right, but so, okay, so, so if, you, if you take the, the largest value here in principle, lambda square shouldn't, uh, so the correction will be, we have checked this. Um, well, in naive, they would say that 100 is already pushing it. Let me see what I look we can we don't we can talk about it in the blackboard, but we have essentially text at this way that you that this could be stable on the potential content of corrections. Matthias, can I ask you something else? Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit more of this uh, in progress cut off? I mean, is this really a unique choice that you can make or else? It's not a unique choice now, but eventually, so you need inflation to last 50 decode for the CD scale. It could last longer, but essentially, the minimum that you want is 50 decodes. The best if you're going for the 60 decodes, you want to have a cut off correction. If you have inflation, which is actually going to earlier on, this will tend to increase the correction. And it's not a really unique. The and uh, just a final thing. So maybe it's related to the part that you didn't tell us, but is there a way, a simple way that you can discriminate this uh, that matter from something that maybe using the distribution momentum or something like that? Well, we have used the momentum distribution and essentially we we applied the what we did in our cross paper together and we got essentially uh, from the computation of the pessimism function, how this thing will affect the matter power spectrum. This gives constraints, but it does not give like a specific uh, signature, essentially. In order to get a specific signature, which should look at over densities and how this thing will actually uh, be affected, because, for example, in this phase of um, large recreation regime, there should be like a strong effect, and this is perhaps even excluded. I don't know, but it's completely clear that. Yeah. Okay. So, there are no more questions. Uh, thanks, Matthias, again. Yeah.